I'm going to start very simple and then we're going to end a little more complex. Muscle, there are three main types of muscle, but for some of the LGMD subtypes, that's important because some have mostly skeletal, but they can also have cardiac muscle, respiratory muscle, and then sometimes even smooth muscle. And of course, there are many muscles in the body. And again, very simple, just walking through muscles, like the biceps, are composed of fascicles. And fascicles contain many fibers. And fibers contain myofibrils. And those are the contractile component of muscle. All right, so we started very simple. All right, limb girdle muscular dystrophies. Prior to 1954, you really didn't have this term limb girdle muscular dystrophy. And then our colleagues over in Newcastle, uh, over in the United Kingdom, uh, Lord Walton and Frederick Natras, they proposed a new name, limb girdle muscular dystrophy, as a distinct subtype. And that distinct subtype separated these patients from the three most common which means you all from the three most common, which is Duchenne muscular dystrophy. That's relatively easy to recognize, young boys that stop walking in that sort of five to 10 year age range. Myotonic dystrophy, and I always tell my trainees that they have 10 seconds to walk in the room, look at the patient, shake their hand, hope they can release the grip, and then leave the room and give me the diagnosis, because that also is a distinct pattern. And then the final is fascio-scapulohumeral muscular dystrophy. And so scapular winging and weakness of the pectoral muscles. And so those were the three that everybody knew. And then there was everybody else. And we'll learn a little more about everybody else. Also, our colleagues over in Europe recently um, sort of redefined the limb girdle muscular dystrophies. And so, I'll just read that to you. Genetically inherited condition primarily affects skeletal muscle, leading to progressive, predominantly proximal, so that's the hips and the shoulders, muscle weakness at presentation and caused by loss of muscle fibers. And that's important because you can have a loss of other things that will also lead to that pattern. And then they said that there are certain criteria that to be a LGMD subtype you have to meet, and those include you have to have more than two families, um, and they have to be unrelated families. You have to at some point achieve independent walking, so that's to distinguish it from the congenital muscular dystrophies. Muscle enzyme levels have to be elevated. There has to be change that you could see on muscle imaging, whether that be ultrasound, MRI, CT, whatever imaging. And then finally, there's a dystrophic pattern on muscle biopsy. So you saw those three distinct phenotypes in the common limb girdle muscular, or the common muscular dystrophies, Duchenne, myotonic, and FSHD. So here are five young adults, and they all look about the same, and yet they all have five different limb girdle muscular dystrophies. And so that's where the limb girdle dystrophies get a little more complicated. This is the other one I give to my trainees, and I say they have 10 seconds, and then we'll have a quiz. Yeah, no. <laughs> All right. So this is just a listing of the named and numbered, and this is, and we'll learn, in the old nomenclature. This is another way of looking at the limb girdle muscular dystrophies, and the way I'll describe that, and looking at the lower right portion and working our way up, if you affect a muscle fiber anywhere within a muscle fiber, on the surface of the muscle fiber, or even outside and around a muscle fiber, you can develop a limb girdle pattern of weakness, a limb girdle muscular dystrophy. And so when we look down near the nucleus, there are nuclear envelope proteins that lead to this pattern. When you look to the left of that at the bottom, you'll see those contractile proteins that are contractile proteins that lead to a limb girdle pattern of weakness. Along the muscle membrane called sarcolemma, you can see that there's a collection, the sarcoglycans, and then alpha dystroglycan. And then to the left of those in yellow, you'll see that there are anoctamin, dysferlin, and other proteins involved in membrane repair. And then you can work your way all the way out to outside of the muscle fiber. And so things like Bethlem myopathy, 
those also lead to a limb girdle pattern of weakness, a limb girdle muscular dystrophy. And this also helps explain why it's more complicated for the limb girdle dystrophies because in that center circle, those are the limb girdle muscular dystrophies, but when you walk around, you can see the dysferlinopathies, DM for distal myopathies, CM for congenital myopathies, CMD for congenital muscular dystrophies. And these are overlapping Venn diagrams where you may have more of a limb girdle phenotype versus a different phenotype. And so this leads us to where we are, which is, that's the real nature of what we have. We have over 120 different genes that can present with a limb girdle pattern of weakness. And so there are limb girdle muscular dystrophies that may have names and numbers associated, or numbers and letters associated with them. But in actuality, when you present to Dr. Johnson or to me, all we know is that, and all you know is you're weak proximally. And so you may be any of these hundred and some genes. All right, let's get to the nomenclature. So what do we call these? It really doesn't matter. You have what you have. Does that make sense? And our job is to figure out how to make that better. So the old is that, and this was in the 1990s when we only had several of these. We said if it's dominant, we'll put a one. And if it's recessive, meaning mom had a copy, dad had a copy, and then it takes two copies to cause disease, um, that would receive a two. And then you got a letter, depending on the order in which each disorder was discovered. And so, for example, LGMD2A is calpanopathy, which is the first discovered of the recessive. LGMD2B, dysferlinopathy. And then you'll see at the bottom, the problem is uh, about three years ago, we got up to LGMD2Z. And right, we either needed a new alphabet or a new nomenclature, one of the two, and the alphabet wasn't changing. All right, so again, our colleagues over in Europe at the ENMC, the European Neuromuscular Center, uh, they met and sort of in a consensus guideline came up with a new way of talking about the limb girdle dystrophies. And this will be important because as we read, we'll see the old nomenclature. As you read articles, now when I look at articles, often it'll list both. And then sometimes it'll only list the new. And so if you're reading something, you'll want to know what is it that you're reading about. So they're named as followed in the new nomenclature. LGMD, D is for dominant, and R is for recessive. And then the order of gene discovery gets you a number. And that's good because we won't run out of numbers. Um, we will run out of genes because they're only 20 some thousand. And so they're, all right, OK. Um, <laughs> And then we talk about the affected protein. And so the example down there is that uh, LGMD2A becomes LGMDR1, calpane 3 related, and so, or just LGMDR1. So that's just for you to know that that's the way you're going to see things probably in the future moving forward. All right, how common are the limb girdle muscular dystrophies? And we're going to talk about this two ways. The first way, is when you look at all the patients that have limb girdle muscular dystrophy that we know about, what are the most common genetic subtypes? And so this is a program that 2015 to 2017, and many of you may have been diagnosed in that. It, it was a 35 gene panel that was offered for free. And out of that, there were 4,600, and I looked it up, 56 patients that were tested. And this is the, the uh, muscular dystrophies, the limb girdle muscular dystrophies that are most common in the United States. So from left to right, calpane was the most common, dysferlin, and then the collagen 6 disorders, Bethlehem myopathy wound up being third when you combine those three genes. The sarcoglycans, when you combine their four genes, was the next most common. And then ANO5, FKRP, and then other of the LGMDs. Our colleagues in Europe at the same time were doing a similar project, and so with over a thousand patients, uh, they also determined that in Europe, calpane is the most common, dysferlin, and then ANO5, titan, and then the collagen disorders and sarcoglycanopathies. So that's sort of 
amongst patients that have limb girdle muscular dystrophies, how relatively common are they? But the other question is, in a population, how many patients have limb girdle muscular dystrophy? And so there have been several ways that this has been looked at. The first is, again, our colleagues at Newcastle, they have a defined population, and they can calculate exactly how many they have, and they came up with 2.25, roughly, per 100,000 in the north of England. And then the Dutch recently published 1.4 per 100,000. The key here is these are minimum prevalences. So the reason we use that term is because if you've not been diagnosed, you don't fall into this. And so all we know is that's the lowest level that this can be. So in the United States, it's estimated that there's probably three to 10 per 100,000, which means that there would be somewhere between 10,000 and 30,000 in the United States. All right, so I'm gonna briefly walk through the limb girdle muscular dystrophy subtypes that are the most common in the United States, and then we'll move on to a couple more topics. So, CalPain, we already talked about in the United States and Europe, and for my West Coast colleagues, that's not true. In the West Coast, it's gonna be dysferlin, but here in the United States, most of the, as, as an aggregate, and then outside of the West Coast, the overall most common is CalPain. LGMD2A, which is now 2-1, CalPain3. It can be inherited in a recessive fashion, but it can also be inherited dominantly, generation to generation. It depends on the mutation. The onset in 75% of patients is between five and 20 years of age. This is a pretty straightforward for us as clinicians pattern of weakness to diagnose because it's usually someone in that age range. And I remember distinctly one young man, he's 17, he's still on the basketball team, pretty good. Um, he's got a deadly three-point shot, so he can park six feet behind the three-point line, and he's like two-thirds. When you examine him, he can do a full squat. That's not an issue. When I have him turn to the side and I say, well, go ahead and lift your leg up, he literally has no strength in his hamstrings or his glutes to lift his leg up because it's completely wasted. So he, he was completely weak in that, and yet he could do squats. So this pattern of weakness where the knee extensors are much stronger than knee flexors, the hip flexors much stronger than the hip extensors, and then the hip abductors much stronger than the hip adductors, that goes with calpanopathy. So, mostly there is no cardiopulmonary involvement. Later in disease, there can be respiratory insufficiency. And the muscle enzyme level is relatively elevated, some sort of in that, I'll say, 1,000 to 5,000 could go up to 10,000 range. And again, if you look at the gentleman here, that's from the original 1996 article. And you can just look at, he's got pretty good quads, but he's scalloped out in his hamstrings when you look at that picture. All right, and the other thing on muscle biopsy, for those of us that do pathology, that have these beautiful lobulated fibers, that's that fiber in the middle there that has that sort of crenated appearance around the outside. And patients do wind up using wheelchairs later in the course of disease. All right, LGMD2B, most common on the West Coast and the rest of the country, and then in Europe, it's one of the second most common, around 10% of all limb girdle muscular dystrophy. Slightly older age of onset in that 18 to 32 year age range. Um, the other thing that's unique about this one and one other is often these patients are relatively good athletes prior to developing their muscular dystrophy. Aha, I saw the point. <laughs> um, the other thing that's unique about this, and uh, we were talking to somebody yesterday, both Dr. Kang and I asked the same question independently. We all know that if your muscular dystrophy starts and within the first maybe year or two after you notice weakness, you have trouble going up on your tiptoes, the answer is you're either going to be dysferlin or NO5. That's, those are the ones that have that distal calf involvement. There are asymmetries, so side to side you may have differences in strength. Almost no cardiopulmonary involvement, so that's very good. 
Um, CK levels can be very, very elevated, and so often in that 20, 25, 30, 35,000 range. And wheelchairs are required in about half the patients in a lifetime. The sarcoglycans, so individually they're less common, but we, when you combine them, structurally there are four proteins that work together at the muscle membrane. And so when you combine them, because they all tend to have the same mechanism, they're one of the most common of the limb girdle muscular dystrophies. This is a much younger age of onset. Almost all patients have onset sort of in that first decade of life. And then there are different phenotypes, meaning some are more affected, and that's that SCARMD, which was in the old, old days, last millennium, severe childhood onset autosomal recessive muscular dystrophy. And we have milder, later onset uh, phenotypes. There is cardiac involvement. The calves can be big. You can get wing of the scapulae. Muscle enzyme levels tend to be elevated. And it's not uncommon for patients to require a wheelchair 10 to 15 years after onset of disease. FKRP, Fukutin related protein, so named because it's a protein that associates with Fukutin protein, okay. Um, it is one of the more common of the muscular dystrophies. 2I, LGMD2I, L it's now LGMDR9. It's very prevalent in Northern Europeans. There's a founder mutation that occurs in literally two thirds of the alleles when they're tested. So it's a recessive disorder, which really means that most people have at least one of those founder mutations. The phenotype it can be a congenital disorder, but it's most commonly a disorder that comes on in single digits or a little bit older. You can have prominent cardiopulmonary involvement, and that can occur early before you have much uh, involvement of your skeletal muscle, and wheelchairs are frequently needed. So ANO5, this is the by genetics, the most common of the limb girdle muscular dystrophies, um, meaning that when you look at the number of people that have pathogenic alleles and knowing that they should combine recessively, it should be the most common. And yet, so far, it's not. And the reason for that probably is a couple of fold. One, we didn't test for it. Uh, two, it's later in onset. So some of these patients are normal until they get to be 25, 35, 45 years of age, and then they start developing their weakness. And so they still had that genetic tendency, but they did not have the disorder. Quadriceps and biceps um, can be uh, significantly affected, and you can see that in the pictures where the biceps in that A panel and at the very bottom um, are significantly affected in patients. Some cardiac involvement, usually arrhythmogenic, meaning you get funny heartbeats or abnormal rhythms, um, but not a lot of respiratory involvement. Muscle enzyme level can be elevated, and most patients remain ambulatory, but later in disease, you can have the need for ambulatory assistance. And then finally, uh, one of the dominant limb girdle muscular dystrophies, LGMD1D, now D1, D1 uh, it's due to mutations in the gene DNA JB6. This is a disorder, as you can see in those pedigrees, that does go generation to generation to generation. Proximal muscle weakness, distal weakness in some patients, it's slowly progressive, as you see on that gentleman trying to get up from a chair. And then the muscle biopsy does have these vacuoles. The arrows are pointing in the left panel, which is orange, which is an H and E, and then on the right panel, which is kind of that bluish color, uh, a trichrome, and those are small little vacuoles. Okay, so those are the most common of the limb girdle dystrophies. If we did not talk about you, that does not mean you don't matter. It just means it is a less common disorder, and it just means that, well, uh, you'll hear from somebody later that does research and uh, it's a less common disorder, and yet it's important. <laughs> All right. Um, <clears throat> so diagnosis. This is something that's changed, and many of you um, either have gone through an odyssey or are still going through an odyssey about how to get a diagnosis. And in the old days, we used to check for a gene, check for a gene, check for a gene, 
And that's not very effective, as this article showed back in 2015. And the answer is we get it wrong not and often. And whenever we talk together, we all have stories about, oh, I knew what that person had. And then you say, oh, no, they didn't. And then you try two or three others. So nowadays, either panels or exomes are probably the most reasonable route to go. And the diagnostic yield is in that 30 to 40 percent range. So the challenge is that still leaves 60 percent or so of patients that will not get a diagnosis through those means. And how are we going to go? And the answer probably in the next year or two is we probably will be moving to genome sequencing. And genomes are not just genomes, they're different types of genomes as I've learned. And so probably the yield will be in that sort of 50 percent range. But as we get better genomes, it will wind up being closer to that 70 or 80 percent range. The reason for this is you can look at the cost of doing a genome. So the first genome took a decade through the Human Genome Project. It cost one to three billion dollars. That's a lot. Um, and so that was the first, and that was in 2003. 2007, there was a Russian oligarch that wanted to have the first personalized genome. You can see it took $8 million to do that, and it took nine months. And the truth is, every year, the speed of sequencing goes up about tenfold, and the cost goes about a half. And so that's pretty great. So right now, we can get a genome for about $450, a commercial genome for about $1,800. And the difference is, 450 is just the getting all the 6 billion pieces of data. The rest of it is the hard part, which is what do you do with 6 billion pieces of data that we know maybe a little bit about maybe 0.1 percent of, and that's the challenge that we're having. There is new technology that is coming out soon, I think. I don't think it's out yet, but essentially it'll be a one-hour, $100 genome, and that's really going to help transform most people moving to that as the platform for their testing. The big challenge, again, will be lots of data, not sure what we know what to do with it. All right, here's the other thing. What if you don't get an answer from whatever genetic testing you have, and nowadays most panels are 100, 150 genes, and next year most of them from uh, the major companies likely are going to explode to about 500 to 1,500 genes per panel. And the answer is, maybe this is not a genetic disorder. And so recently it's been described that there are patients that have five, ten years of slowly progressive weakness. They're followed as a limb girdle muscular dystrophy, and they actually have a treatable disorder due to an autoantibody. So make sure you keep that in mind. The other is you can do further genetics. Um, in current panels, sometimes there are certain disorders like the metabolic myopathies that can look like a limb girdle dystrophy, especially in older onset patients, and that will not get picked up because you're not looking at the gene that is the gene of cause in your disorder. You can look for other disorders that are not looked at well in panels. You can consider, even today, genome sequencing, and then you can also do for those that have variants of undetermined significance, so either two copies of undetermined significance or one known pathogenic mutation and an undetermined significance in a recessive disorder or a single uh, dis uh, uh, variant of undetermined significance in a dominant disorder. And so then you can sometimes look at certain manifestations of the patient to say, do they fit with this disorder? And so we had a family that had a dominant pattern of inheritance. It was a variant of undetermined significance. In this particular muscle disorder, they also get a bone disorder called Paget disease. And so we checked a specific lab for that. And then we did an MRI of the thigh. And his MRI of the thigh is on the left, and a drawing of the typical pattern is on the right. And this patient has this particular disorder. All right, I'm only going to touch on this because there are great talks coming up about future treatments. So we are transitioning to uh, genetically based therapies, and so one of the best ways that I think we're going to move forward
is, in a lot of the recessive disorders, is to give you a copy of the gene back. And that's pretty straightforward. We can take an adeno-associated virus. We can cut out the genes from the virus. We can put in an LGMD gene. Or, interestingly, in some disorders like dysferlin, we can put half in one virus and a half in another virus. And then you can actually inject somewhere. You see the AAV particle on the left there. Somewhere between 10 to the 12th and 10 to the 14th copies of this virus and therefore copies of the gene. It then goes, it's incorporated into the cell, into the muscle fiber, into the nucleus. It releases its DNA payload. And then that DNA payload just becomes like a little mini chromosome. It's called a plasmid. And it can just keep making whatever the protein is for that limb girdle muscular dystrophy. And the nice thing is this has um, been shown to work with direct intramuscular injection and then also with systemic IV delivery of virus. And so if you look on the left, the left three panels there are the patient prior to treatment. And the, this is a protein that's around the muscle membrane. So you see nothing because it's not there. And then the right panels, those are the post-treatment patients. All right. I am ahead of schedule by two minutes. So I'm just going to briefly touch on there is a new research consortium. Uh, Dr. Johnson is going to talk more about that. But we're very excited about this. This has, again, been sort of, I'll say, three years in the making, really about a year and a half. Uh, we all met together in the wilds of Utah up in the mountains and said for three days, how do we put this together? And so. I'm just going to go through. This is the GRASP consortium. And there are things that we're trying to do, which include if we can have a common platform for everybody, for all the different limb girdle muscular dystrophies, so that as industry comes up with, or as we come up with different therapies, there will be a means for the trials to occur. It'll be nice because one of our other goals is for the half of patients that have variants of undetermined significance, if we can figure out more um, expeditious ways to get an answer, that will be helpful. Um, and then the other thing that has always struck me, and those of you that have recessive disorders or dominant and you have siblings or parents that are affected, you're not always the same. Sometimes you're actually quite a bit different. And then the question is, why is that? And the answer is it probably has a lot to do with modifier genes. So these are the participating institutions. And I'm going to say thank you. And I always put that up because I always welcome anybody sending me questions, comments, or whatever. Thank you very much. All right, nice overview, uh, Dr. Wickland. And I want to thank everybody and just uh, echo the excitement that we feel up here on stage. It's great to see so many people out there at the International uh, Limb Girl uh, Conference and that um, you know, we appreciate all the enthusiasm, enthusiasm there is um, uh, to learn more about um, everything that's going on. And also to say that um, there's really, and, and uh, Dr. Wicklin alluded to this, striking parallels between the efforts that the Speak Foundation, Jane, and C3 put together to really start to combine efforts, combine energies across different uh, limb girdles to, to unify and become um, a stronger voice. About the same time, as, as Matt said, we were, um, we were doing the same thing on the, on the investigator side. Uh, and I have to say that we had a very productive uh, two-day meeting uh, this Thursday and Friday uh, here in Chicago uh, and are excited to get this, our projects off the ground. So, uh, and, and Matt covered a lot of this. I'm going to um, go, go through some of this again. So why are we doing this now? So, um, as Dr. Wickland said, our ability to diagnose limb girdle muscular dystrophy has uh, improved. Um, the uh, schematic that you see over there uh, is a representation of the outcome of that same free genetic uh, sequencing test uh, that Dr. Wickland uh, alluded to that the MDA and Jane Foundation uh, put together. So you can see that it's great um, that we have that, uh, what we consider solved. So these would be people who uh, have a confirmed diagnosis. Uh, but 
but there's problems also with, with the other, uh, the rest of the pie, right? So either negative genetic testing or unresolved variants of unknown significance. So, uh, you know, it's been great, like I said, so the cost of commercial testing has lowered um, to at least uh, 250. That number changes all the time. Uh, and that's really helped uh, increase the number of people with a, with a good diagnosis. But it's also increased the number of individuals with variants of known significance and negative testing. Um, these are people um, with a limb girdle pattern of weakness. It's not to say that um, you know, the, the weakness is real, the phenotype's real. You know, it's just that it's um, difficult um, to go without a, a good diagnosis. And at the same time, um, as Dr. Wicklund said, advances in gene therapy have identified limb girls that are, are eligible or potentially eligible for this gene replacement therapy. And you can see a picture there of a muscle that's been treated um, with, an, with a beta sarcoglycan uh, 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 gene therapy, gene replacement therapy. And research in other companies are developing other molecularly targeted therapies. So we're really getting into the age of what we consider disease modifying therapy. So these aren't just therapies that would help you alleviate your symptoms, but really with the aim, aim and goal of uh, changing the overall course of the, of the disease progression. And there's real possibility that because of that, and you're gonna hear lots of talks uh, over the next two days, of several clinical trials in limb girdle happening over the next five years. So um, the pace of therapeutic development has outpaced our efforts to prepare for clinical trials. There's a lot of work that we have to do as researchers to get ready and make sure that these clinical trials have every possibility, every, um, every likelihood of showing the event. The worst um, possible outcome, in our opinion, is that you have this great, amazing, highly promising therapy, and we actually don't know how to measure whether or not it's gonna work, because that would mean that it wouldn't be approved by the FDA. And so, um, you know, this is a, a great cartoon that shows that, you know, the therapies have really outpaced our ability to get ready for those clinical trials. And so, we as um, researchers, um, and a lot of credit uh, goes to uh, Dr. Wicklin and Dr. Weil and Dr. Statland, uh, who sat in this, this first meeting um, to identify, uh, and others, uh, the gaps that needed to be addressed. So number one, how we diagnose people with limb girdle muscular dystrophy. Gap number two is the tools that we will use to measure response to therapy in clinical trials. And number three is an understanding of the patient experience of living with limb girdle muscular dystrophy. So um, that led us to form a clinical trial research network. So um, that's really simply defined as a group of academic or private research centers who agree to work together to accomplish common goals. And our, our, what that um, offers is an, a more efficient process for running clinical studies. Uh, because all of us met together, because we all trained on the same outcome measures, we can actually do multiple studies at the same time. It's a much more efficient process. And um, there's a lot of power in numbers. So if we can implement ra rational diagnostic workflows, we can reach more people with limb girdle. We've agreed to pool resources so we can answer lingering questions in natural history or outcome measures development for limb girdle. And we can ensure that findings at one site uh, can be replicated at multiple sites. You know, again, there's a real kind of practical um, nuts and bolts um, strategy here that you know, it's great if you can do all these um, outcome measures at one particular center, but it's really important, it turns out, to have everybody be able to do the same outcome measures in the same way. And so because we've included multiple sites across the country and the world, the findings are more likely to represent a broader LGMD community. So um, uh, Dr. Wicklund introduced this. So we formed this consortium known as the Genetic Resolution and Assessment Solving Phenotypes in LGMD. That's very important to have a, a good acronym. Um, and the goal is to uh, hasten therapeutic development for limb girl by improving diagnostics, developing outcome measures, understanding the patient reported disease impact, uh, and then pilot studies for new biomarkers. And then, you know, it's also important, um, not all of us are gonna be around forever. And so we wanna make sure we train the next generation of limb girl researchers. So these are the um, current network members. Um, uh, so uh, at Virginia Commonwealth University, uh, Kansas University Youth Medical Center, Nationwide uh, Children's Hospital are our lead clinical evaluators. Um, Dr. Weil at Washington University is where the biobank is located. Uh, we've been uh, happy to have uh, Dr. Straub at Newcastle University, uh, Dr. Amato at Brigham and Women's in Boston, uh, Dr. Wagner at Canyon Krieger, 
Dr. King at University of Florida, uh, Dr. Matthews at University of Iowa, Dr. Wicklin at University of Colorado, uh, Dr. Mozafar at University of California, Irvine, uh, and uh, Dr. Leck at Yale University is really helping a lot with the diagnostic um, workflow. who have tried very hard to uh, include a broad uh, geographic representation. Uh, and, and this has led to, uh, again, uh, focus on innovation and collaboration, so trying to think outside the box, see if we can find ways to um, design more efficient clinical trials, um, to speed the ability of these, uh, if, there's, if there's a true signal that this drug is uh, going to work well, we want to get that um, as quickly through trials as possible, um, and new avenues for treatments. Um, and so, um, you know, it's, it's the same thing, like I said, I can't say that enough, that uh, we need people to come together to test these ideas in large groups. And if we can agree on those common approaches, we can accelerate, accelerate uh, drug development. So this is um, uh, gap one in more detail, so improving diagnostics. Um, because of the possibility for gene replacement therapies and to guide medical surveillance, uh, we feel like, uh, pretty strongly that um, it's not really sufficient anymore to just say, well, they have limb girdle muscular dystrophy. Um, you know, it's important to understand, if possible at all, what the genetic cause of that is, uh, because uh, a lot of these therapies are going to be molecularly targeted. So, as I said, about 20 to 25 percent will end up with confirmed diagnosis uh, using current panels, uh, but about 55 percent will have a variant of unknown significance. It's really kind of an in-between result. And then about 20 to 25 percent will have no mutation. So what do you do next? So uh, for the variants, um, you know, what's, what's next? This is actually a, a, a huge problem uh, because we can resolve some of the variants, uh, but we're way better at identifying them than resolving them. And so what that means is that you have to have the ability to say whether or not that, that genetic uh, mutation or genetic variant is just you know, background noise in the human genome and is benign and not causing disease, or actually is the, the disease causing mutation. And so um, there's a couple ways you can do that. So does the variant uh, track with affected individuals in your family? That's a good, uh, Dr. Wicklin had a good example of that um, individual who had a, a father who was affected as well. Or in large groups, if you can see the same variant occur over and over, that, that can be quite helpful um, to understand whether or not it's disease causing. Um, we can look in uh, muscle tissue, so this is an um, example here of uh, staining for um, alpha sarcoglycan uh, for LGMD2D, and you can see that uh, there's a control uh, muscle there, and you can see that there's that staining around the muscle, and in that individual, the, the protein is missing. So we can use special stains to see if the protein is present. And um, sometimes you can't do that, so, uh, you know, certain... Um, um, forms of muscular dystrophy, you can't stain for it. Um, so you can look at other what's called functional assays to see if the mutation is damaging. So uh, the example on the, on the bottom there, you can see that uh, this is an experimental cell line and it's looking at this LGMD uh, 1D or D1 um, uh, variant to show that it's um, actually disease causing. Uh, and then we can you know, continue to work and use other techniques like looking at uh, the RNA expression. Uh, but the, right now, this is what's being ha what happens right now is that each one of us is doing this individually by ourselves, and so uh, it's quite cumbersome um, and not very efficient. And so the workflow needs to be standardized and needs to be adaptable to each person's situation. Uh, and so that's what the consortium is working on. And then, uh, you know, if there's no mutation, what do you do next? So. Um, as Dr. Wicklin said, you can expand what you're looking at with either whole exome sequencing or whole genome sequencing. Uh, we can look at mutations that affect protein splicing, which um, sometimes are not always uh, readily apparent on traditional sequencing. Um, but gene discovery um, often requires a large number of patients and many steps. And again, um, this is an area where uh, it benefits uh, quite a bit from uh, collaborating together and is another area that the uh, GRASP LGMD consortium is working on. Um, so um, here, uh, talking about gap one, our goal is to um, uh, enroll up to 2,000 individuals with either a variant or no mutation and to create a rational workflow to resolve those variants. And of course, you know, this is really a service, so the idea is to make that work and workflow public and also to allow for a pipeline for new gene discovery. And uh, we've, been, we've been working very hard 
uh, with um, those individuals um, offering free genetic testing uh, to establish partners and allow this work to happen in the most efficient fashion. All right, so that moves on to gap two, so tools for clinical trials. Um, so um, you'll hear a lot of different terms for what this is, but the, the easiest way to say is that outcome measures are tools that will tell us if something in limb girdle has changed between two points in time. So there's lots of different um, kinds of outcome measures. So there, um, if you measure in the blood or muscle, um, these are often called biomarkers. Um, or sometimes these are something that a physical therapist or other clinical evaluator assesses, like the, your strength or your ability to do tasks. Um, or there are patient-reported outcome measures, which are questionnaires you fill out to describe your experience of limb girdle. And so, um, you know, ideally an outcome measure is uh, pertinent to you. Uh, is reliable, so it doesn't change between day to day, um, and it doesn't change between sites. Um, and it's sensitive to progression. So the more sensitive that our outcome measures are to change, um, the, e the easier it is to see whether or not a, a treatment's going to have an effect. Um, and of course, we're always interested in things that are feasible and, and inexpensive and readily adaptable. So you need the right tool for the right job. Um, so. Um, you know, measuring gene expression, for example, won't tell you whether or not someone's experiencing pain, um, but you need different tools. So different tools are important at different times in the drug development process, and we really do need more than one tool in that toolbox. There's no single outcome measure at the end of the day that's going to be um, the, the thing that says that this drug is working or not. Um, so for uh, gene therapies, the obvious biomarker is uh, to measure expression of the missing protein, which is similar to what they do in DMD. So you can see, again, this is another example of, um, you know, looking at a control versus a treated muscle. Um, so that's, you know, one approach to biomarkers. Uh, for some limb girls, it may be um, things that we can measure in the blood, so evidence of muscle destruction or inflammatory markers. Um, it can also be things like MRI. So these are, um, this is an um, example of a muscle MRI. Dr. Wicklin has had a couple of these where you can see um, whether or not um, the fat content or uh, fibrosis of a muscle changes over time. Um, so something like MRI can be helpful as, in terms of a biomarker. But there's still a lot of work that needs to be done. So most of the biomarkers that I showed you there um, need to be um, tested in multiple different uh, forms of muscle, uh, limb girdle muscular dystrophy. Um, they need to be shown that they're responsive over time um, and that they're reliable. Uh, strength and function. So this is really the bedrock of the clinical outcome measures that, that we're working through. Um, so you can see some different examples. So that's uh, something called manual muscle testing or quantitative myometry um, or measuring force during movement. Um, so there's many standard techniques that have been uh, used for measuring strength. Um, that you can see there in the different pictures. And uh, many standard measures for things um, um, that are actually, at the end of the day, probably um, the number one most important thing. So it's, it's interesting for everyone to see that the protein level is restored, and it's very interesting to see that the fat content of the muscle is, is better. But what's really actually important is can you do more stuff? Right? That's the, that's the end of the day. Um, and so um, there are many standard measures for things like um, how do you walk, how do you get up from a chair, go upstairs, how far can you reach? Um, and so these are things that, that uh, we're working on. You can see an example there of a video game that our colleagues at Nationwide Children have, have developed that helps um, measure how far you can reach. Um, and then you know, the other way to think about outcome measures is that you can actually combine tasks into a composite. And this has been um, done uh, in the limb girdle muscular dystrophies in the North Star assessment. Here again, there's lots of work that needs to be done. So we need to standardize our equipments and procedures. Uh, we need to train our evaluators, which I'm happy to say we did um, uh, Thursday and Friday. Um, and that we need to understand the relationship to genetics and age and gender and baseline functional status to make sure that we're using the right outcome measure uh, for the right person in the right uh, clinical trial. So uh, we've, uh, as I said, assembled a team of physical therapists with decades of experience working in muscular dystrophy. Uh, and we have a toolbox of possible outcome measures for limb girdle. And we're going to test them um, starting uh, in the next month or so uh, in a two-year study as part of the network. And we hope that this data can help our industry and academic researchers when planning for clinical trials. Um, how many people do you need to show that the drug is working? How long does that study need to be to show that there's a, a real effect of that particular therapy?
Um, so these are the current studies. Um, uh, you should, in the exhibit hall, um, be able to reach out to our project manager um, to um, see if uh, she'll take your information if you're interested and uh, help get you to the closest uh, site geographically to you. Um, so you can see there recruiting participants uh, with uh, LGMD 2A, 2B, 2L, and 1D and visits and baseline in 12 months. Uh, and there'll be additional studies for sarcoglycanopathies and FKRP mutations in the future. So that brings me to gap three, which is the patient perspective. Um, you know, it, it kind of gets back to the same thing where, again, we can show that the gene expression is restored. Uh, we can show that you can reach a little bit further. Um, but it, you have to show, again, that it matches the perception of the disease that you're experiencing. Um, and so we're in the process of developing a limb girl specific health inventory, which is a questionnaire that you would use in clinical trials. Uh, that helps us in two ways. So it really, it does help us, again, um, not only to, to capture the patient experience during the course of the clinical trial, uh, but it also helps to make sure that we are measuring the things that um, are important to you. So again, you know, our, our assumption um, is that strength and mobility um, is, a, is a serious issue in limb girdle, uh, but you need to validate that against, um, up against what the patient experience is. So we started with patient interviews. Uh, so these are themes that uh, to address mobility and ambulation and the ability to perform activities. Uh, we did, uh, under these uh, patient interviews, identify issues with respiratory function or cardiac issues that may not apply to all forms of limb girdle but are important for people whom it's an issue. So the next step um, is to uh, replicate those patient interviews in a large survey to determine how common each symptom is and how impactful that is on someone's life. Um, and then that instrument can be validated in a prospective study. Um, so this is the, uh, these are the results uh, here of the number uh, of 20 patient interviews with a, a number of individuals with different forms of limb girdle muscular dystrophy. Um, and what uh, these uh, interviews took about an hour and they were transcribed. And from those, you could uh, extract the quotes and say, well, how frequently did somebody talk about a particular theme? Um, so, and, you know, I think the, the results there you can see uh, make sense to most of the people in this room. So problems with mobility and ambulation, inability to do activities were the two most frequently mentioned um, issues. Um, and all of this comes together uh, to get us ready for uh, clinical trials. Um, and so the ability to understand normal progression of the disease and how it impacts the type of tools we can choose for measurement. Um, so this, this uh, vector plot, so what, uh, what you can see there um, is some work that's been done by our colleagues in Duchenne muscular dystrophy. And, you know, frankly, the limb girdle researchers have the benefit of having our colleagues in DMD uh, have, having worked through this for a number of years. Um, so, you know, we've learned from, from the uh, directions that they've made, some of the mistakes that they've made, some of the, some of the successes that they've had. Um, so I think, you know, the nice thing is that we're not having to pave an entirely new road. We can see uh, what, what, what generally works. And you can see uh, in this particular, this is uh, measuring how far somebody can walk uh, individual uh, boys with Duchenne muscular dystrophy. And so it's important uh, when you look at that, you can see uh, that on the far left side of the graph, you know, there's some of those uh, boys that are actually getting stronger. So that makes it hard if, that, if those boys were enrolling in a clinical trial to show that they were actually having clinical benefit um, from that drug. And so, you know, it, it helps us to make sure um, that the, we're using the right outcome measure uh, and so that we don't mistakenly restrict, re reject a drug or therapy uh, that may actually work. Um, I've said this a couple different times, but really it's important to design, design more efficient trials. More efficient trials mean um, that um, fewer people are exposed to the risk of a, of a brand new novel therapy, and most importantly, it allows uh, that therapy to be tested um, as quickly as humanly possible. Uh, and reducing the, uh, the burden on individuals participating. So again, uh, reducing the number of people that are required for those early studies. Uh, and then, you know, uh, uh, getting back to that DMD example, you want to make sure that we're designing um, good confirmatory studies that, that the FDA will accept um, as being uh, appropriate for the disease. Um, so there are still several gaps in our understanding that need to be addressed. Um, so how does the genetics and, and um, baseline um, status and demographics influence the rate of uh, progression? Um, you know, not everybody with a uh, 2A is going to look the same, and, and even though we, we think we have an understanding about when the disease starts, but how does it look at different age ranges? 
um, and um, is there a way to predict how somebody might uh, do over the next year? So those are really important um, uh, focuses that we're thinking through. And that's what we're here to help get an answer for. Um, so uh, in summary, uh, so clinical trial preparedness is a collaboration. It's a collaboration with all of you. Um, it's a collaboration with uh, the patient organizations that are here and helping, um, and helping put this um, all together. Um, it's a collaboration with our colleagues on the basic science side who are helping to develop those new uh, therapies. Uh, and it's a cl uh, collaboration with us on the academic side to help prepare for clinical trials. And of course, our, our colleagues in industry who are helping to steer those uh, new therapies uh, to uh, approval. So understanding the natural history and how we measure things, um, you know, it's not, I know it's not as exciting as being able to test a new, uh, being uh, exposed to a new um, exciting uh, gene replacement therapy, but it's an important and essential step of where we are now and where we feel a great deal of urgency to get that work done um, so that we can make sure that those new therapies have every chance to succeed and it makes sure that we don't discard a, a treatment that might be beneficial. So uh, having this network allows us to get sites ready for, to participate in clinical trials. Um, it creates a national group to train coordinators and evaluators and can actually help individual investigators or companies take their drugs into clinical trials. So there are uh, many ways to participate. Um, so uh, our project manager is Brittany Holmberg. You can see her email right there. Um, if you contact her, she'll put you on the uh, list and help get you to uh, the closest um, center. You can find studies uh, on www.clinicaltrials.gov. Uh, you can find the network online. That's the website. Uh, so there's lots of different ways to participate. Um, and, and um, you know, the last thing I'll say is that there is uh, significant progress in the drug development, uh, but we do need patients as these early phase um, trials begin, um, begin and, and just to really emphasize that uh, focus on uh, partnerships. Uh, and of course, uh, I want to thank all of the investigators in the consortium, um, many of whom spent the last two days with us uh, and, and many of whom are still here this weekend to spend time with you. Uh, and of course, our support uh, with the MDA and uh, Coalition to Cure Calpinopathy and Sarepta. Thanks. <laughs>